In today's lesson, we're going to talk about what took place with World War II from the European perspective, or also sometimes known as the European theater. So you'll be on page seven of your interactive notebook. Just remember as we go through these notes, there is gonna be a lot today. So if you ever need to change the font size, feel free to do that. Or you can always add another page just by clicking add slide or copy slide. So don't feel like you have to fit it all in on this one slide. Um, you can either make the box bigger, you can make the font smaller, or like I said, you can always add a slide. All right, let's dive in. So let's back up a little bit and talk about how, uh, let's continue our discussion with the rise of dictators and looking at how aggression started to spread throughout Europe. So by 1936, Hitler had rearmed the nation of Germany and started sending troops to an area known as the Rhineland. The Rhineland was a, kind of like a buffer area between Germany and France and had been set up that way after World War I. By 1938, he starts to move his troops and starts claiming land for him, himself. He annexes the country of Austria, meaning he just kind of claims it and says it's, it's his, and he demands that he be uh, given the area of the Sudetenland, which was part of, uh, at the time, a country known as Czechoslovakia, which is one of my favorite words to say. So he says, I want that back as well. He is going through and saying, look, I'm reclaiming territory that was taken away from the country of Germany uh, post-World War I. And that's what he kind of plays it as. I want to get back what was taken away from me and my nation. By 1938, um, the what become known as the Allies, Great Britain and France, are getting a little bit worried because Hitler is going against what the Treaty of Versailles laid out. Um, he's rearming, he's expanding, and these little red flags are starting to pop up. He's doing things that he should not be doing, or the nation of Germany is doing things that they should not be doing. And so they want to meet with him and say, look, all right, what, what can we do to slow this down? Because we don't want another world war. Really think about it. By 1938, World War I had only ended about 20 years prior. So it very well could have happened that a young man who fought um, and survived and became a veteran of World War I could potentially be fighting in another world war. You know, figure if you were 20 years old, you're probably only about 40. So you definitely could be in a war again. So they met in 1938 what becomes known as the Munich Conference. And the goal of this meeting was to stop Hitler, to say, look, slow your roll. We get you're upset about the Treaty of Versailles. All right, we, we need to come to a conclusion here. and You, you need to cut it out. Um, the result of it, uh, that they come up with what becomes known as the Munich Pact. And basically they say, all right, Hitler, you've taken a few things. We get it. This is it. No more, you know, you got all your toys. This is it. No more. Um, and, you know, you can have what you've taken if you promise not to take any more. And as you can see in this picture up here, he's shaking the hand of Neville Chamberlain, who was the then Prime Minister of Great Britain. Everything's fine and dandy. Um, and this policy becomes known as appeasement. An appeasement is basically you don't, you're trying to give in to the demands of a, an aggressor to avoid something. And in this case, it's avoiding war. You know, you could think about it as, you know, a you know, your typical on TV high school bully, give me your lunch money or, you know, you give the lunch money so you don't get beat up or whatever. Um, but appeasement doesn't always work. And as you can see in the graphic here with the guy shaking the hand with the fingers crossed behind his back, that's ultimately what happens. By March of 1939, Germany goes and takes the rest of Czechoslovakia. And that plan, that plan of appeasement just does not work. Hitler, you know, it was kind of just a holding pattern. You know, he he had planned to keep going is what, what she did, what she does. Now, France and Brit Britain, you know, again, they're trying to hold out as long as they can. They want to avoid this war, but they both pledge to each other. Um, they tell Germany, like, look, if you keep going, it, it's going to mean war. Um, Hitler, you know, is doing some backdoor deals as well. By 1939, he signs what becomes known as a non-aggression pact or the Nazi Soviet pact with Joseph Stalin. Remember, he was in the Soviet Union. And basically what they say in that non-aggression pact is that if Germany is successful, well, first off, let me say, they sign a non-aggression pact saying that they're not going to fight each other in World War II if something happens. And then the second thing is if, if Germany is successful, they're going to split up Eastern Europe. 
and return some of the land from Russia that they lost and basically kind of divide it up and split it between the two of them. But they decide that they're not going to fight each other. And this cartoon you can see here, a political cartoon, um, this becomes very popular during the time. And as you can see, I always get giggles about this cartoon in class. Um, but it portrays, as you can see, Hitler on the left. And we know that because of the Nazi swastika symbol. And then Joseph Stalin. Um, and they are portrayed as being married, because think of a, a pact as kind of like a marriage. And the caption here reads, wonder how long the honeymoon will last. And a big reason for why they put this, or why this cartoonist put this caption is because the world saw this Nazi Soviet pact, saw this non-aggression pact, and they knew it was only a matter of time before one of the two did something to the other or broke that pact. Um, and we'll come back to this idea in a few minutes on a couple slides later. Um, but so, you know, realizing that the two forms of government these two gentlemen ran did not work together. Both of them were very power hungry. So it, it was something that this, this marriage or this pact was not going to last for very long. Um, now, what was the United States result? You know, what are they doing at this time period? The United States basically, we wanted to stay out of everything. You know, by 1939, you know, in the mid-30s, we're dealing with the Great Depression. We're kind of in the height of it. We're dealing with a lot of domestic problems. Um, so we adopted this policy known as isolationism. Basically, we're on our own. We, you know, we're not going to get involved. And we tried to do that as long as possible. Um, we, we did try to help out a little bit. Um, mostly because it would help production in the United States. But in 1935, we passed what was known as the Neutrality Act, and it basically said we are not going to sell arms, we're not going to sell weapons um, and supplies to nations that are at war. So we're staying out of it. By 1939, that policy changed a little bit because, again, we're still in the Depression. We're trying to ramp up production. We're trying to get uh, the economy going. So they create what's known as the cash and carry, cash and carry, cash and carry policy, um, which kind of, you know, we said that we would sell to anybody, but it's more aimed to help aid the allies. Um, and that's going to get us into a little bit of trouble, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So what does it look like in, in Europe in the beginning part? So by 1939, September of 39, Germany invades Poland um, with an attack known as a Blitzkrieg. And this is what officially starts World War II because they roll into uh, Poland, which Germany had said, we're not going to take any more. He breaks that Munich Pact. France and Great Britain declare war the next day. Um, so September of 1939, that's when it, you know, World War II officially starts. And as you can see in the pictures here, this is your Blitzkrieg attack. Blitzkrieg uh, was a, a German word that means lightning war. And it's very, very quick, very fast um, strategy or military tactic where you took your enemies by surprise. Uh, they would use uh, bombing airplanes from above to bomb the area. They would roll in with their tanks and their troops. Um, but it was just very, very effective and very fast. Um, and that's why um, Hitler becomes very successful in the beginning. Um, from about September 1939 till April of 1940, not much happened in the war. It was very slow moving. Um, American papers actually called it a phony war because not much action was taking place, not much was going on. By April of 1940 though, those Blitzkrieg attacks ramp back up again. And he is able to knock down different nations basically like dominoes. So he had Poland, he had Austria, he had Czechoslovakia prior, you know, prior to this time. Now he takes Denmark, Norway, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg. By June of 1940, he invades and conquers in France. And that's a big deal because France was the one that really punished and hammered during the Treaty of Versailles. So the fact that they fell was, was a big deal. So by June of 1940, the only country in Europe um, that wasn't neutral or was, wasn't on Germany's side that stood but was left was Great Britain. They stood alone against Germany. So they have to figure out what they're going to do. So that leads us into the Battle of Britain, which takes place during the summer, late summer months into the early fall of 1940. And it's basically the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, my German is terrible, versus the RAF, or the Royal Air Force. So think of, you know, like we have the United States Air Force, it would be their, you know, the German equivalent and the um, um, Great, the Britain equivalent. Um, um, luckily for the Allies, Britain is able to hold them off. Um, it was a very difficult time period, but they are able to hold them off. By June of 1941, coming back to that non-aggression pact, 
Hitler breaks that pact with Stalin. So again, you know, the, the, the cartoonists, the people we knew, people knew that it was not going to last for too long. So Hitler double crosses Stalin. Um, he invades Russia through Poland. And it was a huge mistake for him because Joe Stalin is like, all right, we're at it then. Um, and he uses a scorched earth military tactic, which means everything is fair game. Um, unfortunately, also, when troops invaded Russia in June of 1941, it was the summertime. But they get stuck. They basically get uh, blocked in and it summer turns into a very, very harsh winter. You know, Russia is well known for being very cold, but they had one of the, you know, on record coldest winters. Um, and so troops are not able to get resources that they need. And that resulted in over a million Nazi soldiers um, being lost at this effort. So it's a huge, huge, huge misstep for um, Hitler to have invaded Russia. The United States starts to see that diplomacy is failing. Appeasement is ineffective. Um, the German... Italian and Japanese government, they both all sign what becomes known as the Triparte Pact, um, and they become known as the Axis Powers. Um, so they are the who everyone's up against during World War II. The United States has to determine, are they going to stay neutral? You know, some people say, are they biased towards the Allies? Um, but they start to give a little bit more supplies and things. They kind of lead towards the ally side. And again, that's going to get us in some trouble because the Axis powers are going to say, hey, 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 you're helping the allies. Maybe you need to be in this war as well. Um, so by 1940, um, some destroyers are giving, um, for, given to Great Britain, some old destroyers from World War I. By 1941, uh, FDR signs the Lend-Lease Act. Uh, and he says that the United States is going to become the arsenal for democracy. They don't like what's going on with Germany, what's going on in Japan. Um, and so they say, look, we're going to help out those who are um, trying to protect democracy. Uh, we also turn, the United States also attempts to stop Japan's movements down in the South Pacific. We'll talk more about what Japan was doing when we get to the, the war in the Pacific. Um, but they are invading China. They're causing a civil war. Um, and so... We basically send Japan and say, look, we are a training partner. Um, we are going to, we're going to give you this ultimatum, like cut it out, or we're going to put an embargo on oil and scrap metal, which is two big resources that they need. And ultimately we do because Japan does not slow down. Um, they are conquering in the South Pacific. Um, and so that leads us into what happened on December 7th, 1941, the attack at Pearl Harbor. So we had a large fleet stationed on our west coast in Hawaii um, in the, at Pearl Harbor. And we, had, uh, we were attacked suddenly and by surprise. It was meant to cripple the west coast fleet so that they could no longer interfere with Japan. Uh, six Japanese aircraft carriers and 353 Japanese planes attacked in two waves. They had three waves actually planned, but after the second, they realized that the element of surprise was over, and so they just they decided to nix that third wave. The ultimate the ultimate result of Pearl Harbor, over 2,400 uh, civilians and um, Navy men, those stationed military personnel stationed at Pearl Harbor, were killed. Um, you know, just about 1,100 alone on the USS Arizona, which is sunk in the harbor, uh, which is still there today. The next day, FDR petitions Congress to declare war. Famous quote from that meeting with Congress, a date which will live in infamy, December 7th. Um, and so war is declared the next day. The United States officially enters the war um, in 1941. Germany and Italy officially declare war in the United States uh, as you know, part of that tripartite pact that they had signed. So the United States is officially in the war, um, and that policy of isolationism is over. So now we have our key nations that are going to be in this war. So we have our allies, which are made up of Great Britain, France, the Soviet Union, and the United States, versus the Axis powers of Germany, Italy, and Japan. There are other nations that are taking part in this war. These are just the big seven. For example, Canada and Australia were also part of the Allies. But again, these four here are the, the big guys um, that are taking place uh, in the war. 
So the European theater. By 1942, the Allies realized that if they were to attack mainland Europe, say go through France, they're going to be slaughtered. So it's, it's just not a reality at this point. It's not an effective military strategy. What they do want to do is find the weakest link. And at this point, Africa and then Italy is going to be the weakest link, uh, their plan of attack. So they send General Montgomery from England, General Patton from the United States to go in and find General Rommel from Germany. And he is, they, the three of these men kind of chase each other around for about a year in North Africa until the, the United States and the Allies are successful. Um, so they are in control of North Africa. And then they're going to go push through to Italy. So the Allies invade through Sicily and up into Italy. A reminder for why we're going into Africa is because, remember, Mussolini, who was from Italy, had decided to go in and start to conquer in Africa. So we realized that this was the best part, to, the best place to start. And it does become successful. Um, by the late mid-1940s, Mussolini is overthrown and killed. And now we're ready to go into Europe. Um, so we are fighting Europe on two fronts. We have the Eastern Front and the Western Front. The Eastern Front is going to be fought from the Russian perspective or from the Soviet Union. And the biggest battle here was the Battle of Stalingrad. It took place between August 1942 to February 1943. And it's basically the Nazis and the Russians fighting throughout the town or the city of Stalingrad. Um, it, it becomes one of the bloodiest battles in, the, in history. Uh, in the history of warfare, um, and it's it's we are success. The Russians are successful for the Allies. The Nazis are defeated, and it becomes a huge turning point in the war for the Allies. We start to see win after win after win after this for the Allies. So again, the idea that um, the fact that uh, Hitler turned on Stalin was probably one of the biggest mistakes um, of the war for for Hitler. The Western Front is fought from the perspective of D-Day, or it gets kicked off with D-Day. General Eisenhower, who's pictured here in the photo, talking to the 101st Airborne before their participation in D-Day, he is the person who planned out this attack. He was the supreme commander of the Allied forces on D-Day, as well as the European theater. So this takes place on June 6, 1944. And what D-Day was, was the largest amphibious attack on, on somewhere um, in, in modern history. Uh, we, they decided to go from um, Great Britain, as you can see in the, this um, photo down here, the map, and they crossed the English Channel and they invaded along the beaches of Normandy. Um, there were paratroopers that went in the night before, as you can see the little paratroops, uh, parachutes there, and then we also had the, um, they call it an amphibious assault because they, they came by water. Um, and so this was great defense for Great Britain because they were an island. It was very, this is something that saved the island of Great Britain during the Battle of Britain. So it made it that as just as challenging to come into France at this time because it's heavily fortified. Um, it was a very, very difficult day. But the United States is able to, the United, I say the United States, but I, what I mean is the Allies because we all work together. Um, they are able to invade across the English Channel and come into Normandy, France. And then we start to push through France and push back Germany um, to, to start to end this war. So again, like I said, it's the largest military invasion in history and the Allies are able to push further into France uh, with their ultimate goal of basically liberating and pushing Germany back into Germany. Um, the Battle of the Bulge is basically Hitler's last major offensive. So we're, uh, we are rolling through this war quite quickly. It doesn't happen, you know, just click, click, click. Uh, it does take years, but, you know, this is another one of the big, big ones. So the Allies are all working together. They're moving from the west, from the south, and from the east. So from France, from Italy, and from, uh, from the Soviet Union. And they're basically closing in on Hitler. Um, Germany was surrounded. And ultimately, they, they are not able to be successful. Hitler sees the writing on the wall, and he is commits decides to commit suicide before he can be captured. Um, so he does that in early May. Um, Germany officially surrenders in May of 1945, and the day after that becomes known as VE Day, or Victory in Europe Day. At this point, the Allies now have to figure out how are they going to defeat, defeat Japan. And this becomes a big sticking point. You know, A lot of the soldiers thought, all right, we get to go home. No, we get redirected down to the South Pacific to deal with Japan. In our next lesson, we'll look at what World War II looked like in the Pacific, 
because again, as all this is taking place in Europe, we have a whole nother part of the world that's also fighting uh, the Japanese. Thanks for tuning in and make sure you enter this into your interactive